I am starting to begrudge Norwegians. <laughs> That's not a good thing. I shouldn't resent Norwegians. Well, let me explain. Recently, the World Happiness Report came out. It surveyed 156 countries across the globe trying to measure how happy are its people, and then it ranks it. Sadly, in this last world survey, America has fallen even another notch down. There are now 18 countries that are much happier. Now, I've always known the Nordic countries. They've been winning this survey for a long time. I mean, the Nordic countries like Sweden and Switzerland and Iceland and the Netherlands and Finland and Norway, they score super high. I know you don't normally think of Norway and Finns doing somersaults, but that's what they're up there doing. Somersaults, handstands, and cotton candy all the time. I mean, they are so happy. And so I know we can't beat the Nordic countries, but on this year's survey, Germany, Ireland, Germany, Ireland, and the United Kingdom were all way happier than America. I don't tend to think of Germans as giddy, but they're way up there now. I also understand, I could see why Costa Ricans and Canadians are way happy, happier. I mean, Costa Rica? I mean, it's so beautiful and mellow. And the Canadians? I mean, talk about perfectly positioned. You can come over for everything that's good about America, but when we go sideways, you can sort of retreat. I mean, I get that. But Germany, the UK, and Ireland? So I'm getting competitive about this world ranking now. So if anyone happens to survey you next year, just do this. We've got to move up in these rankings, so just do this. When they ask, do you feel happy, say, I'm not really sure how I feel, but I'm pretty sure I feel better than Germans, UK, <laughs> and Ireland, okay? We've got to move up. Well, I'm entirely teasing about a competition for happiness. That would be a miserable thing if we turn happiness into a competition. And of course, we would love it if people are happy everywhere. I mean, even the idea of ranking happiness, I mean, that to compare yourself to others is a miserable thing to start with. So the whole thing is kind of deeply ironic to rank happiness. Rank is rank, right? I mean, there's nothing happy about it. You want everyone to be happy. But it struck me as I saw that list, I love happiness, but what I would worry more about is whether people have hope. There's no world hopefulness study that I know of. And I want all human beings to be happy, but I need the world to have hope. It's hope that, that that helps human beings strive and live a life oriented to the future. It's hope that drives our most noble aims. It's hope that gives hope. There is no world hopefulness ranking. But how are you doing on hope? If you were surveyed right now, are you losing hope or gaining hope? We just lit the candle of hope. We've entered Advent now, the four weeks that the church prepares itself to, to greet the Christ child, to recognize the miracle that God is doing through Christ. We just lit the candle of hope, and each week we'll light a new candle. I'm starting a sermon series called Guide Us to Thy Perfect Light, and we'll, first week is the light of hope, and then the light of peace, and the light of love, and the light of joy. Last night in the Saturday night worship, I, I give the same message essentially, and, and it's all about the light of hope. And we lit that candle, and I looked away, and I looked back, and the candle had gone out. We forgot to put oil in it. <laughs> A whole sermon on hope, and hope went out. <laughs> we put oil in that candle right now. So, 
There are no studies on hopefulness, but I think we can learn something from all the studies being done on happiness. Let me explain. There's one researcher about happiness that thinks Americans could be happier if we had a more nuanced language. He thinks the English language doesn't have enough different words for happiness, that they're, they're too kind of bland and unnuanced. And he thinks that we experience things based on words. So like an Eskimo has like 400 words for snow. So they experience snow in a very intricate, fully developed way. He thinks we don't have enough words for happiness. And it doesn't give us emotional granularity. He thinks that nuanced words can help you explore different little granular aspects of your emotions and claim your happiness. So, he started this whole project to gather words from other languages that are kind of untranslatable, but would help us learn more nuances to happiness. So, he's been using words like one from Hebrew, firgan. Firgan in Hebrew it's a lovely word. It means the happiness you take at someone else's success. Oh, you know, in our society, we tend to feel minimized by someone else's success. I mean, we feel like we're in such a win and lose game when someone else is doing really well or they're winning, we feel like we're losing. It's ridiculous, but that's how we think. He thinks words like fear gun can open your imagination. It doesn't have to be like that. You could just, without jealousy, take joy and happiness in seeing all the success in people's lives around you. Think how much happier we'd be if you took joy in another's gain. Oh. Actually, in German, they have the exact polar opposite word, schadenfreude, which is, is when you take pleasure in someone's misery. This is taking joy in someone's success, Fürgen. He takes words like this and tries to teach us the nuances. He uses one in, from Cro, uh, Croatian language, um, it's jaka. By the way, I'm slaughtering the pronunciations of these, but jaka. And jaka for Croats, it's the type of happiness or, or it's a sweetness when you're doing nothing. The sweetness of doing nothing. I mean, in America, we always have to be busy, busy, right? We always have to be doing something. We think that will finally, something will make us happy. But this word jaka, the sweetness of just doing nothing. Oh. He uses one from Japanese, wabi-sabi. And wabi-sabi means the happiness you take or the joy you take in seeing something that's beautiful but imperfect. Wabi-sabi is a type of rustic or weathered or imperfect beauty, and it's the joy you take in seeing that. Well, we think everything has to be perfect, don't we? Everything has to be perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect to be good. Wabi-sabi means look at all the things around you. Look at the people in your lives. They're not perfect, but they're good. Wabi-sabi is taking joy in something that's not perfect but beautiful. I'm slaughtering the pronunciations, but in Japanese, there's another one he uses, uh, mono no aware, and oh, it means the pleasure you take when something beautiful is transient, meaning you know it won't last long. You, you know it's fleeting, but there's a special pleasure in something that for that moment is beautiful. Oh, what we could learn from these words. We, we don't live in the moment very well, and we're always trying to grab hold of things, and we're, we're, we're afraid of change, and everything is fleeting, really. And that word helps you realize just appreciate it. Take the happiness in it now. Everything moves on. Okay, I think we can use his strategy for happiness about hope. I think we need more nuanced understandings of hope, so I want to teach you a foreign word that I think will give you a broader and deeper sense of hopefulness. It's an amazing word. 
It comes from our Bible. It's a Hebrew word for hope. It is tikva, tikva. And oh, how this word develops in Scripture. Watch how it layers and nuances the meaning of hope, tikva. In Hebrew, it just means hope if you translate it into English. But watch all its layers in Hebrew. The first time that tikva appears is in the book of Joshua. Remember, Joshua, the right hand of Moses who has now died, is good to lead the people into the Holy Land right? Joshua has the armies of Israel aligned as they're about to enter the Holy Land. They are going to uh, siege Jericho. He's about to fit the battle of Jericho, Joshua, right? But first he spends, you remember this story, he sends two spies into the town to reconnoiter the situation. Those spies go into Jericho. The king's men in Jericho start to hunt for them, but Rahab, do you remember Rahab? The prostitute whose home was actually in the wall of Jericho, Rahab houses those spies from Israel, hides them under these bundles of flax on her roof so that that they escape from the king's men. They tell her as they're about to leave, when we invade the city, if you hang a scarlet cord out the window, we we will spare your family. Your family will be safe, you and your family. This is Rahab. So she hangs this scarlet cord. Here is the first appearance of this word in history. That cord is called tikva. It's her hope. But but first the word just meant this cord that Rahab hung from her window. Already in Hebrew, the word hope doesn't mean some abstraction. It means something you can hold on to. You can be tethered to. Do you remember Quicksand? It used to be in movies. I think Quicksand disappeared from movies and TV shows around 1975. But when I was a really little kid, there was always Quicksand, like on Gilligan's Isle or in Tarzan shows. And it was really an absurd notion. Someone would be walking along. They're just kind of walking along, and they just step into quicksand, and like immediately they can't get out. I mean, they were just right next to solid ground, but somehow they're in the middle of quicksand, and it got in my head as a little kid, quicksand, you start to sink slowly, right? And and here was the thing about quicksand. If you move too much, you sink faster. Do you remember that? So you have to stay really still, but you keep sinking lower. But here's the thing about quicksand. Everything would be fine if you just had something to hold on to, right? If you just had a branch or a rope. This is where the meaning of tikva starts. That that there is something to hold on to, a cord, that if you're feeling that sinking feeling and not sure things will be okay, you have something to hold on to. That's the first meaning of tikva. But then, in the... Later in the Bible, in the book of Ruth, it takes on a different nuance. Tikva appears 34 times in our Scriptures, first in Joshua, but then next in Ruth. Do you remember the story of Ruth? Uh, Naomi, her mother-in-law, they're in Moab, and there's a famine. They decide to go back to Bethlehem. Oh, hear the nuance of our season. They're going back to Bethlehem. Remember, too, that Rahab, the prostitute, and Ruth are both named in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew. This tikva gets wrapped up into the very genealogy of Jesus. But here, do you remember when Naomi says to Ruth, "Uh, stay, leave me, I've got to go. Do you remember what Ruth says to her? Whither thou goest, I will go. I will live with you. Your God will be my God. Do you remember that? You see, it was... It was Naomi saying, I am losing tikva. That's where the word appears. There is no tikva, but then Ruth says, I will come with you. Here, tikva takes on the nuance of being a person. Other people in our midst can become tikva for us, our hope. So first it's a cord, something you can hold on to. Then there's the possibility it could be a person, could be your tikva. Then next in the Bible, tikva appears 13 times in Job. 
and you would get why it does. Job is suffering horribly. Will he be able to hold on to tikva? He's suffering unjustly. There's no reason. He was a righteous man, he's, but he's suffering horribly. Will he keep tikva? Thirteen times that word is repeated, but then finally tikva appears lastly in the Psalms. So it goes from being a cord, something tangible, to, to maybe a person, to how we deal with suffering, to then in the Psalms, tikva. It becomes God. Listen to Psalm 71. In you, O God, I take refuge. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress. You are my rock and fortress. For you, O God, are my tikva. You, O God, are my hope. Oh, this word tikva. Hope becomes something you can hold on to. Or it's a person you can follow or gain strength from. And then it's God. This Advent, when we light the candle of tikva or hope, we're saying that the Christ will be our tikva. The Christ is something you can hold on to. Christ, Christianity becomes a tradition. The word religion itself means to bind together. It speaks of being a cord. The whole tradition is a tikva, something you can hold on to. You can hold on to the faith. And Christ is a person that we can follow, our tikva. And Christ is of the divine, our hope. Did you see the scripture you had in your hand? It was in Romans where Paul is quoting Isaiah, the root of Jesse shall come. Through Rahab, through Ruth, the root of Jesse comes to be our tikva. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you might abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ is our tikva. We'll never be as happy as the Norwegians, ever. And that's awesome. I'm happy for them. And happiness is awesome. But it's hope. It's hope that helps a human being flourish. So if in any way you're having that sinking feeling, in any way, let us hold the hope for you. For hope can be a tradition or a person as well. If in any way you feel like you can't move enough in life and you're going down somehow, let us be your tikva. Take hold, my friends. Our hope is coming. Amen.